So I can see the text basically. Okay. So, but basically, you can see here that uh, you know the robust series they differ from headline inflation to blue line sometimes. You know, uh, I remember talking to Ed at some point. If you look at the, the right back, right? But it's definitely a difference between median and term mean inflation and, and headline inflation. Right? So they can be skewed to either side, actually. If you look at the 70s, um, um, and the, the range has uh, just pretty large, about 0.8 percentage points, right? So broadly, they agree, but there's the, 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 you know, the position which might be on the um, And you can think about this. Um, more generally, so how are we going to do this? Well, we have the objective that we want to match some kind of trend, and we can use either current trend or future inflation. Um, and the first, the, the current trend inflation is the same measure that people have used that develop that so we just follow their footsteps. You can think about others. So we use standard moving averages plus minus 16 months. Alternatively, we also have the appendix and you know, the band has it, so we drop anything with a frequent that's below 39 months or so. And then second, we use future trend inflation again following the other set methodology. So there we look at forward moving averages. And we have a variation of the appendix. And we consider three different periods 70 to 22, 70 to 89, or two from the very recent period, uh, and look at the root mean to an error. Now we have uh, our robust measures by IT evaluated against the different two targets here. Um, and just to we clearly could go a little bit further here, but we exclude P1970 the exercise. And I think we have something in the appendix simply because a lot of theories don't have many price changes in the earlier periods. We want to be sensitive to that. Um, right. So we did two things. First, we evaluate official robust measures and look at their performance. And then we look at a wider range of trends, looking for an optimal. So here I'm showing you. How the efficient measures so the term mean and the, the, the median. And you can see that uh, evaluated relative current and the future trend inflation for the three different periods. And the first one in black and solid versus the gray one is the, the longest period. And I'm showing you root mean squared errors. And then you have headline, term mean, median for the two official measures. And you can pretty clearly see a division between headline and the two measures here. So trim mean and median, they're both much better than doing no trimming. So I think that's a pretty clear lesson that we all know. That's why we like to use these, these measures. Uh, but you also see the uh, trim mean is slightly better than the median, so which we get from this people Mariano test. And that's mainly due to the more recent period here. Where you see that the median is uh, but the term mean is thing better than the mean. And it's also mostly looking at the current trend. Of the All right, so how do you do the cross terms? So we can have different terms than these, right? So it's a colorful picture. And they are answering basically what is the root mean squared error relative to an optimal term? And I include. Um, if you can see the headline inflation of the dog here, um, and you don't trim the Dallas term, the, the median, even the I term, and then um, so our best term. And so, what do these colors show you? So, blue means you know you are doing this as well as the best term with the lowest mean squared error. So, you can pick that, and that is at uh, shedding 20 and 22 percent on the two sides. But you see very strikingly, this looks like a flame, right? When your kids play with fire, um, or you know, when you can lap, and this is like a flame, blue flame, there's a lot of blue there, okay? Uh, so that means there's a range of trends, but well, it's very similar root mean squared errors. And you can also see the whole thing is tilted a little to the left, right? So you turn it not entirely symmetric. So you turn a little bit more on the upper side here, the often. And if you were looking at future trends of the target rather than the current trends, you get even a bigger blue area. Okay, and that's probably all I show you for future trends. Um, but I have uh, some extra slides for everything else I show you. But I stick to current trends for now. Um, okay, so what what are these optimal terms? I, I just mentioned this right so here for the current trend as a target or already over a period. 
2022, so we get the lowest group mean curl error. Um, note that pretty much for all of these pairs, the trims differ quite a lot from the official one, from Cleveland Fed and Dallas Fed. So those are 24 and 31, or you know, looking at the median. Um, I think at the same time, the optimal trends are also just slightly better than any of the official measures. Um, that's what we do. This is Steve Mariano test, very test against the minimum of the two optimal ones. Um, oh, sorry, the two official ones versus our optimal ones. So you can test whether the two are different, and basically that's, that's not, not the case. Um, this is late today. Okay. Um, how much time do I have? Here? Six minutes. Okay, great. Thank you. So, what's the what's the range of of the best trends? Again, I'm I'm looking at the, the current trend here. So, here this figure tells you, um, if we're given trim me trim uh, root mean squared error, we find something that's statistically different from an optimum trim. Um, so you have the different trims on the x-axis of the lower, the upper trims on the, the y-axis, and if you see it in color, you know. The p value of uh, the test for difference uh, test in the root mean squared errors. And you see that there's a wide range of equivalent trends. So right? that's the blue area where you can't really uh, see any statistically significant difference to, to the optimum. Um, and, you know, again, so slightly tilted away from the 45 degree line data. So a little bit more trim on the higher inflation category. So this brings me so to one of the, the key takeaways here, right? That not all these trends are created equal. They have different predictions. Um, so despite this large set of equivalent trends over the whole period, um, for any given one, the levels of what you're actually gonna say in robust inflation is that can differ substantially. You see this a little bit from this gray moving over time. So let's now zoom in and yeah, I'm showing the implied levels uh, of uh, relative to for, for current trend, and they differ. Uh, in particular, I'm looking at uh, term mean inflation for May 2023 for our best trends. Again, you have the, the uh, lower trend here and the upper trend here for the increases. And you can see uh, in red um, the difference, uh, so the, the inflation rates that are associated. With this exercise, uh, they range from somewhere like a little bit below three to maybe 3.7 percentage points. So that's a, you know, that's a sizable difference even for these optimal trends that remember the blue area that's typically giving the same root mean squared error. Um, just to put this in perspective, also, right, annualized inflation and that period actually was 1.6, 3.6, and 3.2. So these are large differences in what, what you're communicating. Also instructive to look at the time series here for the robust inflation ranges. So here again, I'm having the current trend in, in mind. Um, and for these blue equivalent uh, trends, you can see the gray shaded range here um, over time relative to the target, um, that's the black line, and the headline inflation is the very bouncy line. And you can see um, that uh, yeah, this is this wide range over time, it's not one particular episode. Um, and um, also, the, the range lag changes in the targeted trend inflation. If you can see this market here or here, it's a little bit more stable. And if we were to look at future trends of the target, so this was this uh, other figure that I showed you where everything is very blue, uh, you would get a, a much bigger range of 1.6%. And I will break sort of my prediction here that I'm actually going to show you this right. So you see this is a much wider gray band over the time. So I'm going to go back here. Uh, I believe I copied the wrong figure uh, last night. So, no, I didn't. Uh, it's a good time. Now I can zoom in even further into the range of predictions right below. I uh, underline this figure. 
I'm showing you here over time um, the range for all these equivalent terms. That's the best 100, the best 50. And you can see, obviously, um, uh, that there are you know, that the range is high over time. Um, it's actually volatile. It ranges from about the 60 basis points, the equivalent to the best term, and maybe 40 uh, for um, the, the, the term for the best 50. Um, now, so my last slide is so what sort of the deeper intuition why so many terms deliver similar outcomes um, but different predictions. Um, so I have two figures here. The left figure shows the coefficient of variation across time uh, when you change the upper term for different lower terms. And here you see the root mean square error also for changing the upper term given different lower terms. And as you increase the term um, uh, on, the, on the upper side, so you move to the right, um, so let's look at the left panel, you can see the coefficient variation goes up. Um, but at the same time, near the optimal term, uh, the root mean square error is sort of the same. Okay, so um, that that basically underlying underlying this result. Um, then you sort of have a discrete distribution where this happens, and the um, coefficient of variation keeps increasing, uh, especially on the optimal term, where the root mean square error then empirically turns out to be. Okay, to conclude, so we have. Then something very simple, let's come back to the 60s, extended back robust measures of inflation. And we asked, you know, and, and I've shown you that official robust measures are sort of optimal at matching trend, but there's something hidden uh, in terms of the average prediction. Um, and a wide range of terms actually deliver similar errors uh, with very different indications uh, for, for the prediction. Thank you. Yeah, pretty obvious questions. I think one is like, did you consider trying to combine these to see if you get the combination of, of these measures would do better at predicting um, uh, headline inflation? I forgot my second question. Sorry, so combine the you mean the different targets uh, that we have in the mean squared error uh, You're taking different measure, different trim measures of inflation and looking at their yeah how, how well they do in terms of predicting. So could you combine these? Oh, uh, we have not done it. That's a very interesting exercise. Um, um could think of all kinds of transformation probably. It, it simply sticks sort of to the, the standard exercise, and we were mainly interested. You know, we are in this high inflation period, so that's I wanted to see what do these robust measures look like in the 60s and 70s, and they actually weren't available. So we thought, okay, let's construct them. And there's a very simple exit motivation here. Um, and I think we can uh, that's also why we make it available so people can use it. Um, um, can definitely answer this guy. I remembered my second question. Good. Yes. Which is, uh, I guess, like you, you could look at how well it predicts turning points or something like this. Yes. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. And actually, if you go back uh, and you look at this, and I don't want to read too much into this, um, but you do see that something, and you know, when you go go up and down, there's sort of maybe more agreement. It's not that you just put a line that looks like a close fit. It actually does, um, but. They're all higher order movements. You could be interested in that. Thank you. Uh, well, along those lines, UNIS varies with the level of inflation. So you can take advantage of that. You know, yeah. Time varying weights because maybe systematically you're under predicting inflation is rising. Yes. That's, 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 uh, I think Rob has sort of thought about this a little bit. So um, definitely those. So, uh, that's what we, we can do. We just want to say simple motivation here. Yeah. So, as well as turning points or narrowing your white set, you could see filter estimation. What is the which one has the best properties or which combination? Yeah, that's cool. So, yeah, so all available. So, we should encourage the. Uh, I think that's a good point. Thanks a lot.
like you dividing the scatter from the three cells that are supposed to get like the uh, optimal lengths, right? So, what if you divide prime of you consider the basic the inflation that you then kind of divide the sample into two and see like how the rates will change in the most recent period versus like you know, we have quite some inflation, like means the inflation going from 2010 to 2020. So, how this will affect the kind of results? Do you think of like just taking the result basically, or just even like 20, 21, 21, 23? Yeah, exactly. And like maybe like each year itself and kind of do the population again yeah. and again. And kind of, you know, if there's a change in the dynamics of the inflation, like in persistence, then the optimal trims like rates will be different in each. I think that that's a really interesting idea here, right? So, um, probably. Be a little bit noisy, but you basically then should be, you know, there's also the intuitive part of seeing what you get, right? I think that's a good point. Thanks for having a training question. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Kind of related to that, you consider our steward campus, maybe? It's possible. Um, ultimately, I think this motivates so, um, on model, right? We have some of very idiosyncratic shots, and some of them are very large. Um, then you can have something like a more model based on the notion of inflation. Um, so, so, yeah, I think this is a good work. Um, right on time. Yeah, thank you. So, um, the notation for this talk is kind of this picture. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we uh, we look at the I mean, it's data from the UK from the UK and they look at the inflation of the consumption basket of uh, an household hanged by the hard car. And as you can see, uh, the inflation of the basket of consumption of uh, household at the bottom of the income in the, the at the bottom of the income distribution has been more higher than the Inflation of uh, uh, the inflation of, uh, of household at the top of the income distribution, and this is explained basically by the fact that uh, household consume different, very different basket of uh, uh, of, of goods. And interestingly, it's not only that the the, the share of, uh, of, uh, of consumption baskets that differ by uh, by, uh, by income, but also what they would consume, uh, what they would consume at the margin when you give them one dollar. So it's not just that you have different type of household, it's really that you have uh, non homothetic preferences. So household change their, 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 their set of consumption when they uh, when you increase their income. So the natural question that you want to ask is how do you conduct monetary policy in a world in which uh, people have uh, non homothetic preferences? So they change their basket of consumption when they, uh, when they have more or less income, and where inflation is potentially uh, driven. By sectoral shock in uh, uh, the targeting to generate different and different inflation rate in different by in different sector and public Okay. So I'm going to give an, uh, uh, an overview of the model and the idea. Uh, the idea is really to have the simplest model possible to try to answer this question. So it's a multi sector uh, 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 model. On the front side, it's pretty standard. Uh, the, in, uh, we are going to have a uh, case and product, and in for, for each product, we basically have uh, a mass one of identical, identical firms that are going to present to, to produce identical sub varieties of uh, identical sub varieties of this product. They are going to be monopolistically uh, competitive, okay? but in steady state, the price of all the sub varieties is going to be equal. And to simplify a bit and avoid to have uh, to have a uh, uh, reallocation issue, et cetera, we're going to have that uh, in steady state, the sale policy eliminates all the all the markups. So in steady state, we're going to be efficient. We have an extension with uh, with uh, input output, but I'm not going to talk about that much about it today. Okay. So this is the front side. It's uh, it's simple. It's just a multi uh, a multi sector model. On the album side, we want to have a heterogeneity in the album, but we want to keep things simple. So we are going to have that basically, albums are born 
with the different uh, labor productivity type and uh, different initial uh, level of wealth, but there's not going to, have to, to, to be any just in practice. So basically, people are born different and they are going to consume different goods. And that's it. We are not going to endogenize that for the model, etc. So to keep uh, to keep six, uh, to keep things stationary, etc. Uh, we are going to have another Latin generation model. So basically, they die at some point and they are replaced by a new household that has uh, uh, the same initial wealth and income as the previous one. So on this side, that's very simple. But in terms of patterns, we are going to be very general, and we are going to assume that household has completely non-automatic preferences. So they are going to be non -amatic, they are going to have non amatic preferences over different sub variety of goods. Okay. So this this inner uh, non amatability is going to generate endogenous variation in market. When you change the uh, the income of of, uh, of household, their their uh, their uh, elasticity of substitution over sub variety is going to change. Okay. So the, the market is going to respond to changing income of different households. And you're going to have uh, non amatic preferences over the time product, so over the K different product, which is going to generate variation both in the, uh, the, uh, the interest rate that I will face, the, the real wage that I will face, and is going to create differences in the welfare impacts that differential, differential inflation trends are going to have on the time of all. Okay, so we also have an extension with uh, uh, different uh, n to max household. To have larger uh, marginal capacity to consume and to, to be a bit more realistic on the front. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in the uh, so it's two stage budgeting. So first, I would uh, given the, the given the total amount that they want to save uh, in category K, we say decide which uh, which sub variety to choose. So we are going to have an additive uh, an additive aggregator. This uh, this uh, this uh, this small uh, this small unit determines the elasticity of the different good. And uh, uh, from this inner problem, you can define the elasticity of substitution across good when u is uh, when u is the power law, you have CS, and the elasticity of substitution across good is going to be constant. When u is not a power law, u is the, 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 the elasticity of substitution is going to depend on how much you decide to spend in category K. And basically, you're going to have a spare elasticity of this elasticity with respect to income. Okay, in the baseline case, we're going to that gamma k, this super elasticity is positive. So when uh, when the uh, the, the algorithm decides to spend more on product k, yeah, the 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 the, the, super, the, is it the, the, the super elasticity is going to, to decrease, the algorithm spends less time uh, comparing sub varieties, and so the market is going to increase. When algorithm spend more on category k, basically the elasticity decreases. The market is being printed. The nice thing in terms of uh, in terms of the the the, the, the firm being identical and the sales side being efficient is that basically the price index for this uh, for all household is the same. So the chain at two first order, the price index for for, for category K, for category K is the same, and it's simply going to be the average of the first order chain in the price of sub variety. If you if you don't have initial uh, prices that are equal, the, the price index of different households is going to be fine. That makes the problem quite unpredictable. So just to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to give a simple example, if you assume that that uh, the the elasticity the the U belongs to the the R class, basically this this gamma K is going to is going to be common to all households, and all households are going to move uh, the elasticity of all households is going to move in the same direction when you change that. Okay. So once you have the price index and the choice of variety, you go uh, you go up one level, and uh, and basically the household then decides how much to spend in each category and solve the the, the intertemporal problem. <laughs> 
the main quantity. Of, so we are completely flexible in, in the, the preference of household over the different uh, the, the different product categories. But the main quantity of uh, the main quantity of interest is this partial EEK, which tells you if you give one more dollar to uh, to household in each category they want to spend. Okay, so it's a marginal budget share of the household. It's also the, the, the slope of the static, uh, the static angle curve of the household. And this quantity is important because basically in the intertemporal plan of the household, the Euler equation of, uh, of the household is given by this equation. And you can see that the real rate that the household face is basically the nominal rate minus uh, uh, the, an inflation index, which is basically weighted by the marginal share. Okay, so those, uh, those, uh, those marginal budget share basically determine the real interest rate that the household face. And in the same way, this, uh, this uh, marginal budget share is determining the, the, the real wage that uh, that household face. The idea is kind of simple is if you have one more dollar to, uh, if you decide to work one more hour, you're going to have a marginal dollar and you have to know in which category you're going to, uh, to spend this additional dollar. And that's given by the by your, uh, by your uh, marginal budget share. Okay. So in addition, in the labor supply, the decision of the household, you have the wealth effect, which is which is going to be important at some point. And basically, the main thing is that uh, low wealth household have another wage effect. When you change the wage of, uh, of low wealth household, they're going to change their labor supply by less. Okay. So the important thing with non-amatic preferences is that you basically have two price indices that matter for the household. You have this marginal, uh, those, those marginal budget share that determine the real interest rate and the real wage. And you have the, the standard budget share that are going to determine the welfare impact of price, of price change uh, uh, on the household. So when you have uh, homopathic preferences instead of homopathic one, you only have one, uh, you have only one price index that matters, the standard budget share, and it's going to be common across all households. Okay, so once you solve the, the, the household problem, you can, uh, you can uh, determine the, uh, the aggregate equation uh, for, uh, for the aggregate equation that are going to determine the system. So you first have your standard, uh, uh, your standard nuclear energy phase curve. So inflation in sector K uh, responds to the output gap, the first term. Uh, but there is, in, uh, in that world with, uh, with non identity and the genus markup, there is an additional term, which is the wage WK. And basically, this wage WK is going to depend on three things. The first two are basically the impact of the endogenous markup. So you can, did, you can decompose the impact of the endogenous markup in two terms. The first term is the aggregate impact of the endogenous markup, with the Y star being the, uh, the efficient output. And basically, the idea is that if you have a negative shock, you're going to decrease the efficient, uh, the efficient output. You're going to decrease the you're going to decrease the, 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 the income of everyone on average, and so you're going to decrease the markup as well through this uh, this super elasticity. The second term M is basically the redistributive effect of uh, the capture the, the how the endogenous market uh, respond to the redistributive effect of shock <laughs> of shocks. Basically, the idea is in the case where you assume that the total city are increasing in income. If you have a shock to the luxury sector, you're going to redistribute from uh, from from people who have low super elasticity to uh, you from people who have high super elasticity to people who have low super elasticity. You're going to decrease the market even further. Okay, so you have two terms that capture the endogenous market, <coughs> and the third term basically. It's kind of a difference between the the, 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 the average wage that's paid to, uh, to household and the wage that the firm pays. Okay? So the if, the, the if you look at this price, uh, this price gap, which is the third term, the first term is basically by uh, when you change prices, by how much you change the, the, the wage of household. And the second term is by how much you change the wage that the that, uh, firm in sector K per the pay the worker. So when you have a shock to sector K, and that you imagine that basically at the margin, although don't consume that much of good K, what 
was going to happen is that you're going to, uh, if pi don't respond that much to the shock, you're going to, uh, to relatively increase the wage that, uh, that, uh, the, that the firm has to pay compared to the firm, here, compared to the wage that you pay to worker, and that's going to push up inflation as well. Okay? So those, 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 are, those, those are the three wages that, that, uh, that, uh, that matter for the, for the median agent fit here. And then you have the, uh, the equation for, the, for all the demand index. So the main one is the equation for the output gap. And the output gap is from the entire rate and to an average of the, to an average of those, uh, those, uh, those marginal budget share index. So I denote by this uh, partial e bar k, the, uh, the average the average marginal budget share of the population. So it's still just an average. There are additional uh, there are additional equations for the uh, for the uh, the, the end of the Venus market, but they are a bit complex. And again, the idea is simply all the shock distribute to different houses. The main thing is that since household die at, uh, at a very slow rate, those those uh, those variations in the end of the Venus market are going are going to be quite tested. Okay, so the system is. Uh, The system is the, the system is a bit large. You have K equation for the NKDC, you have the additional equation for the relative price, you have two K equation for the for the endogenous market, and one for the output gap. So to give the intuition of what happened in the model, I'm going to consider basically a simplified version of the model that had chosen most of the channel of interest. So the main assumption that I'm going to use in the book is this uh, this assumption HC. Which basically say that the slope of the the slope of the the slope of the Phillips curve kappa k, okay, kappa k is uh, with respect to uh, to uh, to uh, the, the slope of the Phillips curve are basically common across sector, and there is no correlation between wealth and uh, between wealth and uh, uh, and the market. Under those uh, under those uh, under those uh, those assumptions, basically the wage. Uh, the value, the wage the value k is going to uh, to uh, is going to evolve independently of monetary policy uh, because monetary policy cannot affect it. And uh, uh, so that's uh, that's the main assumption. When you don't have an endogenous market, you have an index that allows you to, uh, to stabilize both the output gap and uh, uh, and to uh, the, the, you have an inflation index that allows that allows to to uh, to stabilize the output gap, and that's the, the marginal index. So basically, the marginal index is kind of the divine coincidence index in that case. But when you're at the endogenous market, you have uh, this wage is irreducible. It's not possible to uh, stabilize both the, uh, the output gap and any of the index. Okay. So I'm going to stay with the positive analysis. So basically, when <coughs> When basically you target the when you target the, the marginal index, if you don't have the gap, you have your standard sector, you have your uh, your standard to a uh, three equation uh, three equation model, and you can stabilize both the output gap and the the the, 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 the output gap and this average inflation index. But if instead of, uh, of targeting the the marginal CPI, you target CPI, you have basically Productivity shock that are uh, that, that becomes kind of uh, that becomes markup shocks. So in the in the in the, the um, in the Phillips curve for the for the for the CPI index, you have this this well, this uh, this wave that comes from the from the from the from the price wave that I denote by NH, and which is basically the non metric wave that depends. On the difference between the, the, the marginal the marginal the, the marginal budget share index and the budget and CPI and the budget share index, and basically this wedge is going to be negative is going to be uh, is going to be positive if you have a shock in necessity and negative if you have a shock in uh, if you have a shock in the So what happens when you target CPI when you target CPI in this world with an necessity? Basically, in that case, the wedge is going is positive, it's going to push CPI by more. So you're going to uh, you're going to have some inflation 
in a, in, a, in CPI, and if you target CPI compared to the, the, the marginal CPI index, you put basically too much weight on, uh, on necessity. So you're going to push down the, the output gap and uh, basically the output gap is going to become negative. So the, in a world with an obesity, if you want to stabilize the output gap, you need to target the marginal CPI index rather than CPI. If you decide to target CPI, you're going to put too much weight on necessity, not enough weight, uh, weight, weight on, uh, on luxuries. So you're going to create fluctuation in the output gap. The output gap is going to be negative when you have a shock in the necessity sector, positive when you have a shock in the intellectual sector. And that's kind of uh, what you see here. You have a shock here, you target, uh, you target CPI instead of marginal CPI. You have a shock to the food sector, which is a necessity. You create, you create, uh, you create negative distortion in the output gap. Okay. So just to do, and I really want to go very quickly on optimal monetary policy. What do you what do you do when uh, when you want to uh, to uh, to do a optimal policy? So you have some additional distribution term, etc. I'm just going to talk very quickly about what you do uh, when you don't care about the distribution. Basically, you have two things that matter for optimal policy when you don't care about the distribution at all. It's uh, it's uh, uh, minimizing the distortion in the output gap and minimizing the distortion in the CPI index because basically. The CPI index weight the, the size of sector, and you care about calvo distortion in each sector according to their size. So it's not possible to, uh, to basically <laughs> both eliminate distortion in the in the CPI and in the output gap. So what you're going to do is to trade up and have the the, the, uh, the uh, and have the output gap that partially absorbs the, the that partially absorbs the, uh, the the wage the value that you have in the uh, in the index. So when you have a shock, when you have a shock in necessity in food, you basically to want to have uh, the, the output gap that's slightly negative to absorb the, the non negative wedge, and inflation that's slightly positive to avoid uh, having the output gap to be too low. So you want to target CPI, but you don't want to target it too uh, too strongly. Otherwise, you're going to have too much distortion in the output gap. When you have a distribution, you have additional terms that uh, you, uh, you basically want to, in addition, redistribute to, uh, to, to households that are not small, and you do that mostly in the first period, and that's really just the, the basically the, 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 the solution for, uh, for optimal policy in that case. You see that for a shock to food in the first period, you're going to decrease the, uh, the, uh, the impact rates to redistribute to households, and after that, you're going to have a negative output gap Partially, uh, partially reduce distortion in the CPI index. Uh, and then uh, there is a bit of uh, there is a bit of shooting, but this part is basically uh, dealing with the, the, the trade-off between stabilizing the output gap and st the stabilizing CPI. Okay, so I think that I'm um, out of time. So let's start here. Questions? So, can you talk a bit about uh, your choice about this particular way to model mathematical preferences compared to like other ways? <laughs> So the, the, the way we model it is simply you have general preferences, uh, in, you, have, you have general preferences, and we let the, 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 the data determine what are those, uh, those, uh, those marginal, uh, you know, those marginal budget charts. So we, there is not, it's in, in a sense, it's almost non-parametric. You just go to, to, to your survey data, you have people, all the, uh, they consume at the margin. Since we do a first order approximation, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of necessary. The main, uh, the main choice is, so uh, I mean, sometimes people to capture difference in a basket of consumption uh, choose uh, instead of having non homotopy to have type uh, to have different type of household that have uh, homotopic preferences. Uh, so that should be a possibility to capture the different effects in welfare. But there is, uh, I mean, kind of the goal of, uh, of this stuff is to show that there, there are other channels that are really specific to non homotopy. And not just to depend in, a, in a, not just to depend in, in basket of, uh, of consumption with some additional preferences.
think this is a really important paper. I, I, I have to digest uh, the very good work. Um, I think just, you know, I didn't see the welfare part so much, but I suppose you can break up the welfare function. And yes, so you can break up the welfare function in the, in the different, uh, in the, in the different components. So the, I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, so if you, if you, if you look at the, the, the welfare function just under this side, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, homotopic algorithm. Like it is the welfare function is kind of similar to, uh, to, to what, uh, to what you have in the, in the standard model. You care about, uh, you care about, uh, 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 inflation disruption that are basically, uh, weighted by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, the size of the different sector. So it's close to uh, it's, it's basically CPI. You care about disruption in the output gap because you have uh, you have well heterogeneity. You have a correction for the different pulse effects. Depend how those are going to have different, to have different pulse effects. So you, have, you have this uh, this additional correction, and basically that tends to lower the the, the weights that you put on uh, on output gap disruption. And you have this additional the, the kind of new thing in this uh, homogeneous scale world are those uh, those redistribution terms, and you have Basically, you have two two terms in the in the redistribution part. You have the standard redistribution term, which tells you that basically, if uh, lower households have a higher uh, have a higher uh, uh, marginal value of income, in terms of compensating uh, compensating them more when they have a negative shock. So this is the standard part. You care more about uh, poor households because the the the, uh, the marginal value of income is higher for them. And you have this new term, which is what we call a bank for the bug uh, redistribution motive. And it's a bit surprising, but the idea is, imagine that you have a shock in the food sector and you have two identical, uh, you have two identical households. Uh, you don't really want to give $1 more to the, to, to the household that's going to consume more food, because since you have a shock in the food sector, food is, uh, food is, uh, is, uh, is, less, uh, is less productive. So with an additional dollar, the household is not going to be, to be able to buy more. Okay, so basically, when you have a shock to the uh, a shock to the food sector because of this motive, you want to consume to people who will consume something else than food. If you have an aggregate, if you have an aggregate shock, so all will become less productive. You basically want to redistribute to people who consume more uh, more leisure at the margin, and those are poor households who have the, who have a larger wealth effect in this matter. So there is kind of this new motive, which I think uh, you don't see that much. It tells you you. In the redistributed part, there is something that tells you you should redistribute to people that consume away from the less uh, the less productive good. So this is kind of the, the decomposition of the welfare function in the in the simple world with uh, with uh, with uh, with non with homogeneous scale rule. When you have non homogeneous scale rule, you have additional terms that uh, that weight basically uh, dispersion in uh, in relative prices. You want to actually match the addition prices. Uh, yeah. So you know, when you discount, you know, there's different price thickness. Different price thickness, yes. So if uh, if you have, so here you don't care, so you don't care about it. You you don't care about relative prices because basically the central bank cannot affect relative prices. And then if you have different price thickness, the central bank can affect the different relative prices, and you want to try to match the the efficient price better. Uh, and so you have all this additional term that I care, in particular the, 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 the interest rate of household that uh, differ, uh, differ because they have, uh, they have different marginal currency to consume on each group. So to, uh, you want to, in part, to match relative prices to try to uh, avoid having dispersion in the interest rate. And if you look at the, this, this minor query, if you look at the... Uh, If you look at the, the, the welfare decomposition, this is basically the, the, the yellow part. It's not a negligible part, this, uh, this discussion in that place. Good morning. Thank you for being here. So uh, I'm Lilian from the University of Bologna, and also I'm working at the Central Bank of Ireland. And today I'm going to present when is monetary policy is more powerful. And this is actually a project that we started a year ago at the Central Bank of Ireland while I was doing my intern. And it's a joint project with Dave Byrne here and Robert Gutat. So the usual disclaimer, I promise, and the views uh, that I present today are just our own uh, views. Okay. 
the idea that non non consecutive nonlinear effects actually uh, date back quite um, has a long history, so it's dating back uh, up to like KMS pushing on a string argument. And more recently, actually, okay, I, I can I can change it from here. Okay. So more recently, a growing literature actually claims that the impacts of the monetary policy depend on various factors like zero lower bonds, liquidity trap, phase of business cycle, or side of policy shock, uncertainty, financial cycle, etc. Like there's a quite large literature growing recently, and they are trying to understand the non-linearity depending on uh, uh, these variables that are basically. Uh, Stated there. So, in this study, we will try to model the non linear transmission of monetary policy shocks in a simple manner. And assume that we are interested in understanding the, uh, we have the dependent variable yt on the left hand side, and we have a measure of monetary policy shock FEST. And we want to establish the non linearity in the interactive FST. So, we can run the following regression, as you can see. The YT depend on the NPSD, monetary policy shock itself. And then we have the monetary policy shock interacted with the light terms ZT minus one. And then we have the control variables, uh, including ZT minus one as well, uh, in the control variables. So, but however, how do we know that the interactive, uh, interactive variable that we include in the regression is the true source of nonlinearity? Actually, like what if there was a second variable and it is correlated with that T? And actually, the MPS is actually nonlinear in that variable and not that T. And what if there were many variables correlated in this manner? So, how can we tackle this problem in that sense? Actually, researchers typically handle the problem as selecting like a uh, variable and interacting with uh, one set of shock before starting the analysis. And different from them, we will actually follow an agnostic approach and allow for data to speak for themselves. So, how do we do that? Actually, we studied the following case. So, here, as you can see, we have the change in YT, and it depends on MPSD and the same interactive variables, and we have the controls. But here, that T is not just one or two variables, but that T is that large matrix with dimension of nz times t and nz is large so so in that setup actually we allow many different sources of non-inner transmission to play off one against each other and we follow a machine learning approach to select the relevant uh, very relevant interactive variables so this study is related to two different strands of the literature. The first one is about the non-linear of monetary policy shock. And as I mentioned, like there are different papers analyzing different variables in that sense. For example, Depot et al. and Bauer et al. Uh, focus on the uncertainty. And they suggest that if the uncertainty is higher than the transmission of monetary policy shocks, will be lower on the uh, medium or long term of the medium more longer term of treasury yields. And in terms of like business cycle, Tenreiro and Twins find that uh, monetary policy shocks are more effective in expansions rather than recession times. And similarly, there's like sign or size of the shock, whether it matters or not, uh, is kind of searched by Barnichel and Menkes 2015. And there's also like another brand of financial stability literature, and they are trying to understand if uh, variables like household debt to GDP ratio or leverage matters in terms of the transmission of contact officials. Uh, one recent paper by Esch in 2021 actually focused on the multiple variables. Uh, they're using the uh, Romer and Romer type like narrative shocks, and their analysis just focused on the pre great recession period, so up to like 2008. And their main, main focus on like the monetary, uh, ag money, sorry, money supply aggregate. So they do not explore really like an expansive data set and the analysis is quite limited in that sense. And secondly, we are related to the predictability of monetary policy surprises. So in the Miranda Agrofino 2016 and Barron's 1 to 2021 paper, 
they claim that the monetary policy shocks are actually predictable. So we either need to like orthogonalize the shocks and take care of these like kind of uh, correlation between the shocks and these variables, or we need to include these control variables in the regression that we have the monetary policy shocks. So I come back to this event. Preliminary work, so all comments are very welcome. To start with data and methodology. Okay, this is the data part. So in terms of like event states, we have the FOMC meetings from 1995 to 2019. And in total, we have like 209 observations. In terms of dependent variables, we have the two day change in five and ten years treasury yields. One year inflation link swaps and SP 500 index to represent equity. So we have like four different left hand side variables. And in terms of monetary policy shocks, we are using the 30 minute change around the uh, FOMC meetings. And this is how our shocks actually look like. As you can see, it's like centered around zero and how it captures uh, the surprise component, for example, here in. 18 April 2001, actually the change was like a 50 basis point decline in the rate, but some part of it kind of already expected by the market. So the uh, surprise component was just 20 basis points. And here, for example, in the 2004 to 28th of January, there was no change in the actual rates, but it was another change in the narrative that they put. So they basically dropped the term that uh, FOMC will be patient to remove its accommodative policy. So they dropped like the patient word and the markets actually priced this as a like positive, uh, positive surprise. So it, it's understood, understood as a, like a, a tightening shock by the markets. So this is how our shock looks like. So in terms of controls, uh, we start from the present data sets, but actually we try to find if we can go beyond the monthly frequency in the present data set. So we try to search each variable in the present and see if there's like a weekly version or daily version available. So we have like more up-to-date data sets that we can uh, utilize, which is the real information set of FOMC before the meeting. So that's why we are using some daily and weekly uh, observation. In addition to that, actually, based on literature, we include some other variables. I think we will be publishing like an extensive data appendix soon. And uh, actually, I will be yeah, sorry. It's, yeah. So, in terms of independent variables, this is how things look like. So in terms of groups, I think these four age groups are from Fred and D. We just did like small extension to them if there is like a specific variable mentioned in the literature and kind of important to understand the effect. In addition to that, like uncertainty is quite uh, highlighted in the literature. So we created like an uncertainty block and we include like 31 uncertainty variables which are different like in terms of new space or like depending on the implied volatility, et cetera, different measures. And we have like some financial cycle measures, again, coming from the literature and some of them are like at quarter the frequency. So in total, we have like four different frequencies and uh, 156 uh, independent variables. And in terms of interactions, what we do is basically we are interacting the lack of control variables with the monetary policy shocks and include them in the regression. So this is how we create the interaction variables. In terms of the methodology, the monetary policy surprises are identified around the FYMC meeting. So this is the meeting day, and this is just the uh, 10 minutes before and 20 minutes after the meeting. So around the Iran study window, we assume that the only thing changed is the, uh, like the surprise, coming as a surprise because there's no kind of data release, et cetera, happening in that window. So in that way, we are kind of uh, assuring that the shock is exogenous itself. And 
Actually, we are regressing the variable of interest in a high frequency surprise interactions and control variables, as you can see here in the regression. And here is that T is, as I mentioned, is large dimensional. And we are uh, utilizing it as a in mean deviation form. So this is also interpreted as like Kitano of Saka Blanger decomposition in the literature. Uh, so this is actually suggested by Oscar Yorta about how to address this problem. So uh, we are here getting like the mean deviation form of the control and interaction variables. So how do we find the relevant interactors? Actually, we are doing like a last door regression here. Uh, that T and monster policy shocks are cast into XC uh, matrix, as you can see. And lambda here represents the penalization that we put for the parameters. So if lambda is zero, it means that we are not penalizing any parameters and it's like simply OLS. And here, as you can see, we have like an alpha term as well. In Lasso, it might be problematic if you include too many correlated variables and like Lasso can have a tendency to select one variable in one trial and like another one in another trial. So to get rid of jet, uh, jittering problem, here we include like a little bit of elastic net regularization and lambda is estimated by tenfold cross validation. And again, like to tackle the uh, jittering problem and to make sure that Lasso is selecting like the uh, true set of variables, we are doing a non parametric bootstrap with 500 bootstrap replications and see like how uh, probable the selection of like same set of variables across different bootstrap replications. So, this is the preliminary evidence. So, do we select more than one interaction variable? This is like the base of our. Uh, motivation so is it just uncertainty expansion versus recession or we need to include more in the uh, understanding of the non-natural admission of monetary positions so here uh, actually here you see like the uh, histogram of uh, bootstrap replications so if so on the uh, left hand side frequency represents like out of 500 bootstrap replications uh in quite in how many of the samples the uh variables are selected so this like this means like uh in 50 out of 500 the variables are selected so as you can see in all of them the peak point is around like this is like 13 this is again around 14 in equities it's even higher so according to last results, we can say that it's not enough to include just uncertainty or like kind of business cycle analysis. So we do select more than one interaction variable according to last results. So do we select more than one interaction variable? Yes. What's next? What next? How can we assess the statistical significance of these estimates? Actually, we check the adjusted R square, which is robust to the number of variables selected in the regression. So it puts like an extra penalization if you include more variables. So here you can see the density of adjusted R square for five periods. And the blue line represents if we do not include the interaction variables, and the red one if we include the interaction. And as you can see, like uh, the mean of interaction they are like 74 percent versus uh i think 62 if i'm not wrong for the no interaction case so as we can see like statistically we can improve the model by including the interactor terms as you can see by the adjust R square and the picture is quite similar if we check it for the one year inflation links about here again as you can see like if we include the interaction we are hitting a better model in terms of the adjusted R square. So other than that, like what we can do, we can check an information criterion and Bayesian, sorry about that. So this is the Bayesian information criterion for five areas. 
And as we know, the bias in information for Italian actually has a tendency to select more sparse models. So it considers like it is kind of in favor of selecting three variables. And as you can see, if it's like less, it means it's better fitting. So as you can see here again, if we include the interaction, the model fit is kind of better than the case that we do not include the interaction variables. And the third thing that we can check is actually average marginal effects. Here, by average marginal effect, what we are doing is that we are taking the derivative of left hand side, in that case, like five year, 10 year yield or inflation links a lot with respect to monetary policy show. And here we will have like two different effects. The first one will come through the direct effect of the shock itself, because we include like MPS in the regression. Plus, we will have an indirect effect, and this will actually represent the effect of the shock operated through interaction and then affecting the left hand side variable. And here we are checking for average. So here the uh, z bar represents the average value in the sample for the interaction variables. And if we check the densities for the So this shows again no means no interactions. Yes means we have interactions. So this shows the effect of monetary policy shock on the five-year yields. And here, as you can see, if we include the uh, interaction variables, the effect of the shock and the shock is like changing the two years around the community node is almost one, like I think zero point nine six on the five-year yield. So the effect is almost one to one. On the other hand, if you do not consider nonlinearity and do not include interactions in the model, then what you find is like quite a uh, small effect compared to what we have when we include nonlinearity. So it means that if you include nonlinearity, if you include interactions and allow for like different states and shocks to operate with this state, actually the effect of monetary policy shocks are higher, so the transmission is higher. Uh, compared to the linear case. And the same actually holds for the inflation link spots. Here we expect this time to be uh, negative. And as you can see here, like if we include the interactions, uh, it is like more negative compared to no interaction case. And how can we check them? Like if to see if this difference is like statistically different, if these two differences like uh, average marginal effect densities are statistically different from each other. So we can do the example of signal test. And here the null hypothesis is that the samples are drawn from the same empirical distribution. And as you can see here, like for all p values, we can reject the null and say that these are like coming from the different distributions when we include nonlinear interactions versus not. And here distance measure shows uh, this is kind of declining. Uh, for equities and one year inflation link slots, but quite high in the case of like five year and 10 year yields. So, which variable are relevant for yields? Here, as you can see, this represents the selection probability in the bootstrap replications. So, exchange rate volatility is selected as the top variable. Then, we have industrial production energy, our quantity index some uncertainty and non-farm payroll surprise, also average our earnings in manufacturing. So it's like a mixture of labor markets and output plus some volatility uncertainty related measures. And for one year inflation link stock, we have like housing starts, one year treasury, uh, consumer opinion surveys, so future inflation, so these are all light data, so it's kind of show that the inflation expectations are somehow like backward looking because what they expect yesterday kind of affecting what they will expect today. And as we can see, we have like quite some extensive number of interaction variables. In terms of economic significance, here what we do is that we basically like try to introduce a rule to understand to quantify the economic significance. And we only include the variables that are selected above 50% probability in the last regression. So here, this is the baseline case. 
and the baseline is like 25 basis points shocks effect. So 25 basis uh, points shock effect, so 5.5 five year yields has like 24 basis points. So it's like one to one, as I saw in the average module effect case. And here, uh, I experimented with health wanted index a little bit. What if the health wanted index is one standard deviation below? Then in that case, as you can see, the impact is low. And if it's above, then it means the effect is stronger. So what does it mean in terms of like economic thinking? So if health wanted index is high, one standard deviation above, then it means that labor markets are quite hot, quite like in a strong position. So in that case, we expect the transmission to be stronger than compared to the other case, when the labor markets are not super strict. So evidence so far actually showed that the higher dimension of non inequity in the transmission of policy, show, policy shocks that has been studied before, and including interaction variables actually improve the model fit and suggest a stronger impact of the monetary policy shocks. And actually, in general, like real macroeconomic variables dominate, but it's difficult to say if it's just one group like output or labor. In general, it's like more of a combination of different groups to explain the uh, whole story. And what's next? Actually, we are trying to uh, improve upon the economic significance part a little bit more. And then we will create like a time series index for non-inerty. And this will be useful to understand like if, for example, in 2001, there was like a meeting and in that meeting, whether the effect of the shock will be like stronger or less strong so it will be relevant in terms of policy i think and we will be exploring like non index in the shock itself positive negative and the swanson has like three different shocks for asset purchases forward guidance and uh federal funds rates so it will be interesting to see the impact of that and also we are working on a European application for so, uh, road actually creating a European factor data set to have a uh, to similar to Fred MD, and we will be uh, doing like a, uh, an uh, application with the Alta Villa 2019 shocks. That one. So, thanks very much for your attention. Happy to take questions now. Yeah. So, um, I'm a very little in the model. If I understood correctly, you're running. Interaction you run, like, for example, the interaction of the market or the with the level of these variables, right? And uh, uh, unemployment rate or the uh, share of household with the variable rate for this. Is it that what you think? Mean deviation of the control variable, not the level, but mean deviation form, actually. So, and like, um, if it's like a day, I didn't go into like details of data too much because like it's quite expensive, but for daily variables, actually, we compare, like, let's say the last observation that I have before the meeting to the two meetings before, right? So it is kind of represent the information that it gets in the like last uh, two no, meetings. No, sure, but well, because I'm not sure what you're thinking about linearity. And so yeah, I'm thinking in terms of models, for example, for me, the, the non linearity, the interesting non linearity, are, for example, when you move from a share of houses with variable rate mortgage of 25 to a share of houses that is 75. So maybe moving to 25 to the 50 percent of houses with a variable rate only doesn't have an effect in terms of interaction with other But once you move above that, the effect is very right continuous. So I think in terms of all of that's usually what happens. Right. And the same, the same with, I don't know, interaction with the labor market or whatever. And so, I think you could do like, for example, instead of having this even this deviation, having partitioning each variable into above the, the median or below the median, and running the interaction with these two separately, so that can be the the, 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 the non-linear effect was when you move from the to the five feet to the seventy percent of that variable, which is usually and then more fortunately, I mean I don't know the, the thing is in terms, again in terms of theory the models. Usually, it's, it's more than just one variable that is interacting. So, for example, I have a share again, share of a household with a rate together with the state of the labor market. These two things can be drug themselves, and then if they have a completely different effect. They want to have a different effect depending on how these two variables improve. So, I don't know why you stop at just one variable. 
I don't know what you can do about that because you expand the number of, of, of regresses a lot. But it, it's true that the same when you were saying, uh, then it's here the second bullet where nonlinear showed itself positive and negative. That depends a lot on the state of the form. I mean, I mean, I mean, and, and uh, well, they have a very, very good yeah, exactly on this point. Then it's just not that's right. Rather than reduce from negative to positive shots, it depends a lot on the different states in uh, which those shots happen. And uh, you might have a positive shot in a, in a, in a very conversation and a few different effects and a negative shot or a positive shot in an expansion. So, it, it is, so I don't know. I mean, it's, it's more kind of uh, trying to see how, how, to, how what, what's the takeaway here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, I think it makes sense to kind of interact things more than just one variable, just kind of a set of variables. But I think then, like, what the input is going to be quite high. Thinking about like we have 156 variables there. If we interact kind of everything with each other, then it's going to be like, no, no, I mean, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I think it's more relevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, you're running like the effect that you're capturing is by uh, the average mean deviation. Exactly. But that exactly. might be zero while just moving to a 75 versus 25 percent. You can have huge linearity which you are missing. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. The, yeah. In the average mean deviation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to actually kind of, I think, like give us a more strong answer if we do it, like, as you said, like, if we increase, like, the divergence between the now we are just for mediation, but yeah, I think that makes sense. Thanks very much. Any other questions? We just quickly had a couple of questions. So when you're showing the one year um uh, link swap, mm -hmm. it seemed to me that we could either add for the two distributions and we're super close to one another, and I was very surprised to see that the end people. This one's the yeah. case, and mm -hmm. yet, I mean, you seem to reject that. Uh, exactly. It was, I mean, I don't know here if, if the number of people starting samples plays at all would be increased. Uh, um, I, I was just surprised to see that at this. I mean, here, looking at this, of course, there's a difference in the, in the mean, but there is so much uncertainty around the, the two distributions. Yeah, yeah. It seems like the interaction is not really. I think like it depends. I think for like treasury yields, we are more confident that like interactions matter. But for like you know, like smoothing spots and equities, I think like the distance also I show like in the end, like kind of getting smaller in these cases. Like according to this test, still we are rejecting and we would like to make sure that it's good beyond just visual evidence because it's difficult to understand what's going on there. Like statistically, according to KS test, we are rejecting. But I agree that like the distance is kind of quite small compared to treasury. So yeah, we are like thinking about how can we rationalize things, but for treasuries, it's like more of the case, more relevant. But I agree, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, everyone, for waking up early to hear this in the morning instead of sleeping in. And thank you so much for including the paper the session. Um, really looking forward to everyone's feedback. This is joint work with Tim Landboy, my colleague, and Hernan Sanchez, who is going on the market. Uh, and this is printing away the mortgages, fiscal inflation, and the post COVID house. So the COVID recession and recovery had a lot of features which were extreme and unique. So it had the highest unemployment since the Great Depression, and the worst of it. We had the most generous fiscal stimulus after that on record. So checks going to basically everybody who had you no know, income below a certain threshold, unemployment insurance, more than 100% replacing income at times. And this led to a surge in government debt and a surge in bank deposit holdings for people who received the checks. So the fiscal impact here was much, much stronger than in other recessions where we focus more on things like QE, you know, getting the interest rate set at a zero lower bound, although that was done as well. And then also in terms of the effectiveness, we had the highest inflation since 1981. So we had convinced ourselves maybe that inflation was a thing of the past. Inflation has come back with a, quite a kick. And also we've had the biggest housing move on record. So not only just in nominal terms, but even in real terms, house prices have been going up rapidly during this period. 
And, and this paper is going to try to study the interaction between these things quantitatively. So what we're going to show is that the post-COVID mix of fiscal and monetary policy contributed to a boom both in inflation and in house prices. So what I mean by the mix between fiscal and monetary policy is first a bunch of stimulus was provided to people. That stimulus on its own potentially could have you know, made the economy recover, but because the Fed did not tighten interest rates afterwards, in some sense, the, the transfers were paid for with the inflation tax rather than with actual raises in future taxes. So in some sense, it was a transfer that didn't really cost anything in the fiscal sense. So it relates to this thing called the fiscal theory of the price level, which relates to when the government provides transfers and doesn't raise future taxes, that can have impacts on inflation and output. So in that sense, fiscal and monetary policy and how they interact is really crucial here. And then all these sort of extreme and interesting stylized facts in the COVID recession seem to be uh, replicated in the model. So the key mechanism is that inflation is caused by what we're calling excess government debt, meaning that if the government borrows and does not raise the present value of future tax revenue to match that in current interest rates. And whenever this happens, there's going to be a surge in inflation, which redistributes between savers and borrowers. So compared to other papers on the fiscal theory and the price level, the fact that we have private debt as well, which allows for this redistributive effects is unique. I mean, other people studied mortgages before, but what people haven't looked at before is the interaction between a relatively large mortgage sector and the economy and of these inflationary effects, fiscal policy, and the redistribution, because these are nominal contracts, so inflation will affect the real value that somebody owes somebody else, is going to lead to a boosting consumption and housing demand, replicating both the rapid recovery from the crisis, as well as the fact that you get a boom in house prices afterwards, because the credit constrained borrowers now are effectively wealthier because, as the title says, their mortgage has been printed away from policy. So the first thing we're going to do is theoretical, is show that we can decompose the effect of fiscal stimulus into three different channels. One is providing liquidity. So if you're short on cash and we give you cash, you will now consume, and that's going to increase aggregate demand. That is also going to cause some redistribution. So if this goes to poorer households more than richer households. If they have different marginal propensities to consume, the poorer households might lead to an increase in aggregate demand. And then also there's going to potentially be a reduction in real interest rates. And that last channel is the only one that seems to be related to inflation, at least in our benchmark theoretical model. And the only way we get that is that there is not an increase in future tax revenue. So you could view this paper normatively from two different ways. One is we were irresponsible and therefore we got inflation. Or you could frame this with exactly the same positive facts as this is just a way to make fiscal policy even more powerful that by not paying for it, we therefore get the surge in inflation, which lowers real interest rates and therefore increases aggregate demand even more. And this relates to the fiscal period of price level literature where we're adding private debt and therefore getting these interesting redistributive effects, which the literature has not studied previously. So fiscally driven inflation increases the potency of fiscal stimulus, redistributes to borrowers, and thereby causes the boom in house prices as well as helping the economy to recover. So I can have a theory model, a sort of slightly numerical version of that, and then a calibration for the sake of time. I might pick and choose a little bit here, but I first want to just get our basic idea across the mechanism. So here are the basic ingredients we're going to need for this effect to exist. We need at least two households, so that redistribution matters. Here we're going to have S of them. And they get consumption utility from non-durables and from the, the housing stock that they own. They face a simple linear cost, K of providing labor, one unit of labor cost K disutility points, and one unit of labor produced one unit of output. So that we have some notion of liquidity mattering here. So if we're quote unquote printing money and giving it to people, we want a notion of money demand to think about whether liquidity effects are really important for the transmission mechanism. We're going to give each household liquidity shocks. And when you get a bad liquidity shock, you can only consume out of your deposit holdings, not out of your labor income or from additional borrowing. Then for tractability, we're going to aggregate our household into families that have sort of a utilitarian welfare function. So these liquidity shocks aren't persistent. Otherwise, you get into this Hank literature with gigantic state spaces. We don't want to go there, but we do want these effects to exist economically, and this is a way to do that. And then to make the housing market matter, the household is going to own housing, and they're going to have a maximum leverage ratio, so a minimum down payment on their mortgage. 
And the last thing is that there's going to be taxes or transfers, and that's what I told about our study fiscal policy. The, the main things we need are liquidity shocks, borrowing against your housing, and then taxes or transfers. Beyond that, it's just the standard consumption, you know, how um, people need that substitution. Okay. So the Euler equation for deposits and for the, and then there's a first order condition for labor supply are the standard things we need. So you're going to save today based on your intertemporal preferences. And what's important here is that if you get a bad shock tomorrow, a deposit that you save today is going to allow you to consume in that bad state of the world. So the degree of liquidity insurance is going to matter if you're a lot of your savings decisions. Then the other equation we need to clear the model is the sort of budget constraint where the real value of deposits today is the present value of future tax revenue discounted to present plus the value of outstanding mortgage debt. You can think of that as like a bank budget constraint that's going to determine how many deposits exist. And because the tax revenue shows up here, that's going to be affected by fiscal policy. So here is, at least without mortgages, which is the simplest case I can plot, what the family of equilibria in the model looks like. Uh, qualitatively, when I put the mortgages back in, I can derive some more things. It's just the equations are a little less pretty. But we basically have upward and downward sloping curves for supply and demand for liquidity in real terms. So the more real tax revenue we raise, that budget constraint increases the real supply of deposits that households can hold. And the more deposits there are, the more insured people are against their liquidity shocks. And that's going to lead to a downward sloping demand curve. Just take that Euler equation and solve for deposit quantities. Then we have up and downward sloping supply and demand. And as we have more real tax revenue, that's going to sort of shift out the quantity supplied, lead to a higher real interest rate and a higher quantity of deposits. So that's the sense in which raising tax revenue to increase liquidity supply can always have real effects on the economy. But what you can't do here is a helicopter drop. So I solve the variables real without referencing nominal at all, which means if I double nominal deposits without affecting tax policy, we're going to double the price level and be exactly what we so that means when we're not in a financial crisis, when we're not with, you know, with Keynesian unemployment or anything extreme like that, you can't really do anything by just sending people checks unless you actually pay for it and therefore have it be a real rather than just a nominal transfer. Now that might sound like this makes things boring, but when we study this now in a crisis where we have Keynesian unemployment and downward binding uh, wage rigidity, then we actually get something very interesting out of this, where if I give you a bunch of checks today, and I don't pay for them. I've learned that once we're back to a sort of steady state equilibrium, I'm going to get inflation then. But when the wage rigidity binds today, I'm not going to get inflation because the wages are stuck at wherever it's been down. And what that means is that these sort of transfers, which are not paid for, cause delayed inflation. So you give everybody checks in 2020, and then maybe in 2021, once the economy is sort of further away from this Keynesian disequilibrium region, you start to get inflation then. But what that means is that the real interest rate is going to be affected today. So here, to show you how this works, we're going to consider a transfer to household at time t, and this is when we have disequilibrium in the labor market. At time t plus one, we're going to clear the labor market again, and then we're going to see what happens. So if I sort of perturb the household Euler equation, I get a few different channels for how it works. So the simplest channel of transmission is just liquidity provision. If I send you a bunch of checks, and you're in a bad liquidity shock state, you're going to consume your check, and therefore, consumption demand is going to go up. The next thing we're going to have is a redistributive effect, where the households that get more deposits are going to save some of them, and that's going to affect their future marginal utility and consumption. And this can potentially differ across agents. So the covariance of this redistributive effect with who consumes more or less out of transfers is going to have an important effect on aggregate consumption. And the last thing, which is where the fiscal theory of the price level shows up is that the real interest rate can potentially be affected as well. I think I have my equation pinned down here, but luckily I have it on the next slide, where there's actually a very simple expression for how real interest rates are affected by these transfers. So let's send everybody a bunch of checks and we're going to borrow in order to do so. That's going to be the change in government debt to change debt. Let's compound that forward one period at the real interest rate, which means if we didn't pay for it at all, how much extra debt we're going to have next period when we're out of the crisis. And then the amount of inflation we're going to get is going to be the difference between that sort of extra debt next period versus how much tax revenue we raise next period in order to pay for it. So the amount of unpaid for stimulus 
is precisely what determines the effect on the real interest rate. And this just comes with the government budget constraint. All we're saying is if you didn't pay for it with an actual tax, you're going to pay for it with the inflation tax. So this is this notion of excess savings people sometimes talk about in COVID. Give people a bunch of deposits. They still have their deposits once the crisis is over. And unless you come and take them back from people, that's just going to lead to a sort of surge in aggregate demand. You could clear the market then with a surge in inflation. So this sort of, you might say, has costs and benefits. You get a surge of inflation after the recession, which maybe you don't want, but that's going to lower real interest rates during the recession, and that's going to increase consumption demand. So maybe you want to have, you know, after every recession, a boost in inflation to make the zero lower bound less binding during the recession. And if we put the private debt in them, the equations here, so all those things I showed you, it's the dot this variable, so they hold with or without mortgages. But the effect of this policy is much more potent with the mortgage market existing, because I don't just get a drop in real interest rates affecting your intertemporal consumption choices. I actually get that if rates fall, you can borrow more against your house. So what the equilibrium looks like is transfers equal to just you receive checks directly from the government, but in addition to that, you get an indirect transfer, which is if you have extra borrowing capacity as rates fall, think of that as like just receiving an extra check equal to that quantity. And that's exactly what would be the same as by gaining that directly in terms of what it does to the overall economy. So borrowers get extra stimulus, savers get maybe a little bit less because of this redistributive effect of inflation, which you only get when you don't pay for your stimulus and future taxes. And because of that, we get a boom in house prices because borrowers are the ones who are the most credit sensitive in their housing demand. Um, so let me show you the medium sized model now. I think this one I'll go through relatively quickly for the sake of time. And we have the same household problem before. I have an embellishment equation for it here. You consider your housing and consumption utility, you supply labor, you get these liquidity shocks. And the important things are just your wealth adjusts over time. And you have this borrowing constraint on your mortgage and this liquidity constraint on your consumption when you get the bad liquidity shock. And there's going to be two policies which matter here now. We're going to add steady prices following Rottenberg, so a quadratic cost of adjusting prices. And now we can study the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy. So taxes are going to adjust with respect to the overall amount of real debt outstanding, more debt raises the taxes. And then there's going to be a tailor rule for monetary policy that responds to inflation into the output gap. And there's going to be a few different regimes here. So in the standard regime we solve these models in, we're going to adjust taxes to balance the budget constraint. And we're going to have monetary policy respond to output inflation. There's a separate regime called the fiscally dominant regime where monetary policy doesn't really respond to the uh, inflation aggressively. And instead, the budget constraint is solved by tax revenue responding. So if you, you know, don't raise taxes, you can have a surge of inflation to balance the budget constraints. And then a third thing, which we might call fiscal dominance light. And I think this is kind of maybe what happens post COVID is temporarily we had loose monetary policy, maybe or maybe not directly driven by thinking about fiscal considerations. We don't know what was in Jerome Powell's head. But if you have like a year of really loose monetary policy, that's going to have similar effects in terms of having a surge of inflation potentially. So we're going to set the Taylor coefficient on inflation to a half, and then we're going to gradually bring it back to two so that we enter the standard monetary dominance regime. So here is what I'm calling a quote unquote COVID lockdown. It's sort of an aggregate demand shock just by making people more patient, the simplest way to do it. If we don't have any policy response, we're going to have a drop in output. The Taylor rule is going to send the policy rate to zero. We're going to have deflation. Wages are going to fall. Um, it's just sort of looks like a standard negative aggregate demand shock. And here's what happens if we have a fiscal stimulus in response to this, where we're going to replace everybody's lost income, um, but we're going to be doing it in the monetary dominance regime. So there's going to be a drop in output, but not nearly as bad, but it still looks deflationary. Inflation falls, real wages fall, and then you're going to get a surge in government debt because you're going to have to pay off all these transfers um, with future rate tax revenue. It looks very different when we're in the fiscally dominant regime. So here we don't pay more for future tax revenue. 
And then that deflation we had before, which you can still see in the blue, no transfer regime, we now get a surge in inflation instead of a surge in government debt. The drop in output is smaller. The policy rate actually goes up, which looks a lot like what happened where we had a nominal tightening cycle, but it just sort of didn't keep up with inflation until very recently. And that's what you would have if you're sort of only partially not responding to inflation. That naturally comes out of a model of a positive but less than one tailored coefficient. And I think this sort of explains the difference between these two ways of doing stimulus. If you do or don't pay for it in the monetary or fiscal regime, either you get a surge in debt or you get a surge in inflation. And in the inflationary regime, the output drop is a little bit smaller. And it actually looks like you have a tightening rather than a drop in monetary policy because the fiscal transfers are so potent. Um, and this temporarily loose monetary policy I talked about was very similar to the fiscally dominant regime, same surge in inflation, same surge in real wages. And that let me just show you now that mortgages amplify the effects here. So comparing a version with no mortgages in the model versus a 60% loan to value constraint to get a sort of realistic measure of people's actual leverage, we get a larger increase in output, more inflation, and particularly for the borrower households who are less patient, we got a greater increase in their consumption. And the reason why we're getting this is through this redistribution, which you can see that the borrower house prices are really booming here. Savers house prices are not really affected so much by the sort of redistributive effects through the mortgage market. And that shows that sort of the fact that the borrowers are rich really matters. Am I doing time? Five minutes, please. Okay, so that is the small model and the medium model. The large model where we take the calibration relatively seriously, I'll go over not in tons and tons of detail, but let me just tell you the really important things that differ. So, so far, the mortgages have been risk free here. And one of the things we have in this paper, which is somewhat new, is a liquidity driven model of risky mortgages, which you can default on. The simplest way to get mortgage defaults is just when people are underwater or sufficiently underwater to default. But I think empirically, people seem to default when they have like healthcare bills to pay, when they lose their job, things of that sort. So we take our cash in advance constraints with these liquidity shocks, and we allow you to potentially not pay your mortgage then, in which case you would have kicked out of your house. Um, so now we're going to have risky mortgages, and there's going to be a banking sector which holds these risky mortgages and has a little bit of equity capital so that their deposits stay riskless. And that's going to have a potential of a housing crisis to show up in the model as well. Okay, so we're going to calibrate this to borrowers and savers as our two types of households. Borrowers is anybody who has more than a 20% LTV on their mortgage. Uh, think of this as you know, not just young households, but even middle-aged, where their savers are kind of more like retirees. But nevertheless, even with sort of only moderate leverage, it's going to be enough of this uh, mortgage redistribution to matter quite a bit. Uh, we're going to have long-term mortgages, which we match to our notion of you know, the effective duration, including repayments of existing mortgages. And we're going to try to match the fact that we now and know well about how income shops affect default. Um, but I should probably zoom into our actual policy experiment for the sake of time. Okay, so the actual COVID experiment we're going to do is first we're going to make households exogenously more patient to cause a drop in consumption demand. And that shock is going to last for two quarters, then mean revert after that. And then we're going to first add transfers. So this is going to be, we give everybody checks, but we're going to eventually pay for the checks. And here we're going to give 130% of people's lost income will be received, which I think is roughly, we've seen that in some calibrations about how big the fiscal stimulus was. And then the last thing we're going to do is add this temporarily loose monetary policy. So we're going to drop the Taylor coefficient on inflation to about a half. And then we're going to have that gradually revert back to two um, with probability 0.4 each period. So after you know, a couple of years or so, it's a very high probability of being back with the central bank fighting inflation. Okay, and here's what the results look like. Here is only with just the standard fiscal policy rule, no actual emergency helicopter drop. People are, uh, are patient. We get a surge in unemployment up to 20%. The policy rate drops, deflation, a real big drop in output, and actually a crash rather than a boom in house prices. That's because everybody's defaulting on their mortgages. I'll show those variables as well soon. And here is what happens with the transfers, but without the loose monetary policy. There's still some output drop, but it's significantly reduced. Um, the policy rate still is going to go down. Inflation is not super different. 
And we don't get a dramatic crash in house prices, but house prices are sort of about flat. There. Here's how it looks with our boost monetary policy. So instead of getting deflation, now we get a surge in inflation. And like in the medium model, the policy rate goes up, not down now. If we look at the real rate, we've got like 10% inflation here, but only a 7% nominal interest rate. So real rates are still sharply low. But this is kind of like Jerome Powell having this tightening cycle, but not to the point where it catches up initially to real interest rates. And the recovery of output is faster. And here, instead of a crash in house prices, we actually get a boom in house prices in real terms of about 10%, which I think is ballpark, similar to the data. And then now let me show you how things are going with the housing variables. With no stimulus, we would have got a dramatic wave in mortgage defaults because everybody lost their job, so they couldn't pay their bills. Real mortgage debt is going to crash. Everybody's consumption is going to be crash. But they actually recover kind of fast here just because like the mortgages all went away for this just gigantic crisis. Here's how things look with the transfers. We don't have the surge in defaults. Mortgage debt is roughly about flat, goes down a little bit. People's consumption drops, particularly for borrowers, and borrower house prices are falling uh, while saver house prices are going up. Now here's what it looks like with the loose monetary policy, where borrower house prices are booming now afterwards. Borrower consumption, despite a little bit of initial crash, actually overshoots because they're so rich. Their mortgage went away, and now they're just happy. Their mortgage debt is going to go dramatically down in real terms. And real government, some nominal government debt might say high, but real government debt actually doesn't go up here. So this loose monetary policy kind of paid for the transfers in some way, caused the surge in inflation, redistributed toward borrowers. And depending upon your views of the welfare costs of inflation, this might either just be the best way to make fiscal policy even more powerful or show that this is the quote unquote bad thing that happens after too much money gets printed. Uh, so let me quickly conclude. So we theoretically and quantitatively analyzed the effects of post covid fiscal stimulus. This stimulus only causes inflation in our model because we don't have these future tax increases to pay for it if you pay for it with the inflation tax instead. That inflation causes monetary, comes from monetary policy deviating from the Taylor rule, and it causes redistribution between savers and borrowers, which increases the potency of fiscal stimulus and also contributes to this large housing boom that we saw afterwards. But thanks so much for listening and looking forward to your feedback. Uh, I have a couple of So the first one is related to something you just said at the end. So what's the, how do I, how does one compare the fiscal governance versus the more monetary governance? I think if you take our model literally, the, now so the a very good example is so it's the good thing for them. Yeah. Um, if you take it literally, I think the, not paid for things is good, but our only cost of inflation here is a reduced form quadratic cost to firms. So I would just sort of say, I don't take our welfare numbers super seriously because we don't really have anything to say about the welfare cost of inflation. Well, how far do you have to take that for the cost? Uh, we, we haven't, yeah, we sort of never really believed it. And the single is how do you model housing market? I have I read about you here, do you have a, in the, in the big model, yeah. in the big model in so the, we keep it very simple. The housing itself just trades in a wall region market. Each generation has a segmented housing stock, so it's kind of like an endowment economy. So you can have separate prices but exogenous quantities. So, and then on top of that, there's the mortgage borrowing and then the option of default. Yes. Uh, so how the government budget constraints works? So what is the what are revenues that the government receives with inflation? Because I don't have C rate, right? So it's not yeah, there's that, no C rate. Right. Yeah, there's just these capital T variables, which are like taxes and transfers. And then they have this fiscal rule that the amount they tax or transfer adjusts to the amount of government debt. So I didn't show the complete detail. There's sort of automatic stabilizers already built into the model. So there's sort of like, you know, unemployment insurance, the regular sense is there. But on top of that, there's lump sum taxes being raised that as real government debt increases are going to sort of you know, with that, with a polynomial term increase as well, but just taxing the transfers are all they have. Okay, so we can switch there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, lots of moving parts. Sorry for the glossing over, but subject to time constraints, I'm going to them constrained off of them. Yes. Thank you. Okay, very good. Smithy, uh, I just a uh, bit puzzled by the fact that uh, uh, you want to explain there is a certain inflation. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's completely missing all you know, the massive uh, energy price shocks yeah. that we have experienced. Yeah, I guess you get the sweating. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think probably what we need to do in the end, and also for the house price, is where we get a similar question of everybody was working from home. That probably has something to do with it as well. Is say here's the true data. Here is our model. Here is how much of this we think our mechanism can explain. Um, and yeah, I agree that I mean the supply shocks are going on as well. Um, I think in terms of timing, I guess probably Ukraine war is the main one you have in mind. There was some inflation going on before then, but yeah, I, I guess it's kind of like the 70s, you could say that the oil price shock were really important, but potentially monetary policy had something to do with it as well. And our, I guess sort of the challenge for us is to give an answer on how much we need to Because policy implication, in terms of policy implication, yeah. of course, it's a completely different story. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I yeah. I, yeah, you, so you, you think that it's free money. Yeah. I know it's not Yeah. But yeah, I don't understand what you're saying. It's really fine. Like, like, exactly. But I guess you're right. And also with the expect. So they have any other Yeah. How about you? So that's fun. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm presenting the opposite. Yes. So, yeah, I guess it looks like the big is. So, I have the model and everything. It's like this is the idea of the interaction with the So, I think one thing was quite what's